Hello. So I am Sharmini Kumar, um, and uh, thank you very much to JaneCon, um, the team at Virtual JaneCon, for allowing us to meet together in this way and for me to present this to you. Um, I am recording this on um, the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation in Australia, and I'd like to acknowledge um, their sovereignty, which has never been ceded, um, and encourage everyone, regardless of where you're, you're um, um, listening or watching from in the world, just to have a think about um, the ownership of the land that you're on at the moment and um, to find ways to honour that. Um, it is actually relevant to some of the stuff that we're talking about today uh, because colonialism is a massive part of Mansfield Park and um, there's not really anything that we can think of in sort of our modern world that's not impacted by it. Um, so we are actually talking about Fanny Price. Um, how do you solve a problem like Fanny Price? It's almost the opposite of uh, Maria in The Sound of Music. She is not too unruly. She's in fact the opposite of unruly. That quote for the title is something to fear in every person and place. And that's a dis that's Austin's description of Fanny. When she moves to Metro Park, she finds something to fear in every person and place. And I think, I suspect like lots of people, I had always not enjoyed Fanny as a character. I found Mansfield Park really hard to read. I found it really um, boring. Um, I found Fanny so unengaging as a character. Um, as I started to kind of grow in my understanding of the novel, um, the, one of the first things I started to appreciate it about, about it was some of the side characters, particularly Mary Crawford, who's obviously a lot more fun, a lot more witty, a lot more kind of outgoing. But also then um, to start to appreciate Austen's depiction of Fanny as a... Um, I guess, product of trauma, at least in, to some degree, um, and a victim of forms of um, family violence um, that are not necessarily physical violence, but the ways that she suffered essentially abuse at the hands of people who were placed in a position of responsibility over her as a child. So some of those things are things we're going to talk about today. Um, just to let you know, obviously, we will be talking about um, neglect, and other forms of family violence. Um, we will be talking about colonialism. We will be talking about some of the speculation around that I have come up with around um, mental health and uh, disability. Um, we will be touching on slavery. Um, there's lots of hard stuff um, in that sort of part. Um, so look after yourself, look after yourself um, because that's something that Fanny was never allowed to do. Um, let's, let's, let's dive in. Um, what did Jane Austen's family think of Fanny? The, they were mixed, as many people are. Um, I do, I do have friends who dearly love Fanny Price and I do not fully understand them. Um, but maybe I understand them a little bit. Um, Cassandra's, Cassandra Austen, so there were two Cassandras in Jane's family, one was her mum and one was her sister. Her mum thought Fanny was insipid, just couldn't stand her. Um, but Jane's sister was quite fond of Fanny. Um, Jane's brother was like, Fanny is a delightful character with an exclamation mark. Uh, this is all done by letter. So we, we, we kind of have their punctuation, which is always funny. Um, and Anna Lefroy, who was Jane's niece, could not bear Fanny. Um, so you get even from her nearest and dearest, people who would give her honest feedback, people for whom she had been writing for years and years, couldn't agree. On Fanny and I think that's that's in some ways a testament to her writing isn't it that people have different reactions to her just like we do to two people in real life um, and it is one thing that we all love Elizabeth Bennet and we all love her spark and her vivacity and um, the way she stands up for herself um, but I think Fanny would be a hard person to to be friends with. I think she would be a hard person to have in your family and in your in your social circle. And so I completely understand why there's this kind of split um, in views about her. Uh, Fanny's personality. What do we know about Fanny's personality from the book? Well, according to Fanny's own mother, she is somewhat delicate and puny. Um, 
and according to the author herself, she talks about Fanny with all her faults of ignorance and timidity um, and with, with Austen's kind of um, um, uh, narration, it's always so hard to know how much of that is actually her value judgment and how much of that is the value judgment that she is assuming or, 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 or holding up for critique. Um, so does Jane Austen consider timidity, being a little bit timid or a little bit um, frightened, a little bit anxious in social situations and things like that, does Austen actually consider that to be a fault or is she saying, look, I know that this is how people respond to that in social, um, respond to that quality in a person, that they see that as a fault? It's hard to tell with Austen's so it's hard to tell with Austen. Um, according to Fanny herself, she obviously does not have a very high opinion of herself. She talks about her own foolishness and awkwardness. Um, Edmund refers to her, uh, her and says, you have, a, you have good sense and a sweet temper, and I'm sure you have a grateful heart that it could never receive kindness without wishing to return. It. Um, so that's a, a you know, very positive, uh, what, one of the very few positive um, reflections of Fanny in the entire novel. According to Aunt Norris, she has a little spirit of secrecy, which means she doesn't tell Aunt Norris everything Aunt Norris wants to know, and independence, which means she won't do everything that Aunt Norris wants her to do, and nonsense about her, which means that Aunt Norris does not understand her. And according to Mary Crawford, which I think is really interesting, that she seems almost as fearful of notice and praise as other women, probably specifically Mary, are of neglect. So she prefers to not be noticed in the same way that Mary Crawford assumes that every woman wants to be noticed. Um, so we get some idea of her personality. And I think some of this is her background personality, certainly her mum's um, view of her comes before she's influenced specifically by the people at Mansfield Park. But um, again, trying to separate out which parts of these elements of her character are natural traits and which of these are attributable to the experiences that she's had is it's hard to it's hard to hard to figure out. But let's keep going. So Probably worth doing a brief overview here if you're not super familiar with Mansfield Park. It tends not to be anybody's favourite and, well, no, that's not fair. It is some people's favourite. <laughs> but for many people, it's not one that they dive into the same way they dive into Sense and Sensibility or Pride and Prejudice. Um, so Fanny is born to a fairly um, lower class, um, impoverished family and at the... At, the age of about 10 she goes to live with wealthier cousins and she lives with them basically through her entire adolescence four cousins two girls two boys um the main action of the novel centers around when the four Bertram children those are her cousins are getting um, older and thinking about um uh, romantic relationships um particularly with a brother and sister that come to know the family at Mansfield Park um Mary and Henry Crawford. So Mary um, and Edmund, who is uh, the, the favourite cousin of Fanny, um, start to at least flirt with each other, at least flirt and, and sort of explore the potential romance, although there's a lot of conflict there that doesn't make it seem like that would ever work out. Um, and Henry Crawford, who's a bit of a, a bit of a, definitely a flirt, a bit of a rake, you might say, um, of, falls in love with or becomes interested at the very least in Fanny. Um, Fanny at some point um, goes home with her with her brother um, to Portsmouth, which is where her family's from, and sees it all in a new light where she's, she compares it basically to Mansfield Park and, and becomes um, disillusioned, I guess, a, a little bit by that. Comes back to Mansfield Park, um, one of her female cousins, Maria has married, but has married essentially for the the, the station in life, um, and ends up running away, um, having an affair with Henry Crawford, which means disgrace on the whole family. Um, Mary Crawford uh, doesn't uh, doesn't see what's wrong with this, so Edmund is horrified and, and drops that relationship. Edmund and Mary, uh, sorry, Edmund and Fanny, um, eventually marry. Um, 
and live happily ever after, I guess. The end. So family, sorry, Fanny's family of origin. There are three sisters um, and one of them is Fanny's mother um, who had nine children of which Fanny was the oldest. So the oldest girl, I should say, sorry. Um, and they lived, uh, the family grew up in the seaside town of Portsmouth. So it's a massive trading centre and I've just got a little picture there for you to have a look at a, at a, a sort of roughly contemporaneous cartoon of the ships coming in and people kind of bustling. You get this feeling of energy, you get this feeling like with barrels coming around, you, you know, people not being tidy or neat. There's some people in that that are probably a little bit drunk. Um, it's just a bit, a bit of chaos. And let me just move this around a little bit. Um, but Here's a quote from what Portsmouth was like visiting her old, her own family, her family of origin, after having lived most of her adolescent life at um, Mansell Park. There was nothing to raise her spirits in the confined and scantily furnished chamber that she was to share with Susan. The smallness of the rooms above and below, indeed, and the narrowness of the passage and the staircase struck her beyond her imagination. She soon learned to think with respect of her own little attic at Mansell Park in that house, reckoned too small for anyone's comfort. So the physical confines are significant in that place. And for somebody like Fanny, who likes to be alone, then suddenly being thrown into this environment where there's noise everywhere, where she can't be alone, she's sharing she's sharing a bedroom um, with her sister that she basically doesn't know anymore. Um, she's become a stranger in her own family again. And there's no sense that they didn't love her or that they didn't um, care about her, but there's definitely a sense that with nine children, there was not enough money to um, raise to to raise her in any kind of comfort um, or luxury, and that's one of the reasons that she's sent to live with the cousins. Um, so you know, money is tight, um, and you get that sense um, from her interactions with her biological parents that they are stressed, that they don't have time to you know work on their character or work on their sort of um, conversational skills or even to kind of sit down and enjoy each other's company because they're just so busy just catching up with the day's chores and the day's uh, work and the day's activities. So, um, yeah, that's a difficult place that she's coming from, but also that she's idealised in that time she's been away. She's with uh, the Mansfield Park family um, and then having that shock of going back to it and realising it wasn't, wasn't quite what she thought. Fanny's family of origin. And so then she goes to Mansfield Park. And it's a beautiful house. It's it's a it's a grand house. It's a big house. But and nobody meant to be unkind, but nobody put the, themselves out of her way to secure her comfort. She had known the pains of tyranny, of ridicule, and neglect. I mean, those those are two fairly strong statements about how little thought anybody gave to what she needed um, physically or emotionally. She um, was there as a charity case. Everybody knew she was a charity case. She knew she was a charity case from the age of 10 when she arrived. So the emotional kind of toll this has on her is, is really significant, I think, even um, especially on top of her having been quite a timid child to start with. She's put into a situation of physical luxury, but always, always have it made to always have it made clear that she doesn't entirely belong there. Um, and in all of that, I mean, you know, she doesn't see her family for a good six years. Her her brothers and sisters, her parents, she doesn't see them for a good six years, and she knows when she comes there that she comes there, she's coming all the way from Portsmouth um, to a country estate that there's not going to be a lot of opportunity to see her parents, to see her brothers and sisters again. Um, and she's thrown in with these family members, these cousins, this aunt and uncle that she doesn't know, that she's never met before. Um, so there's that, 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 that's traumatic in itself, I think. Right? And then we've got her guardian, Sir Thomas, Sir Thomas Bertram, who says specifically up front that, that she needs to be made aware that she is not a Miss Bertram. So you, she is not to be treated the same way as her cousins are treated because they are growing up to be proper Bertrams and she is the poor cousin. She's always to be the poor cousin. 
later when um, Henry proposes to um, Fanny and Fanny says no. Um, so Thomas tries to convince her um, to, to marry him. So Thomas, um, she's always been a little bit afraid of Sir Thomas. Uh, he's the he's the sort of very much the patriarch of the family, um, and uh, he basically approaches her and says with a good deal of cold sternness, and he, and it says too that he came towards the table where she sat in trembling wretchedness. So you you get the idea that Fanny is sort of visibly upset, and he comes towards the table. There's no indication that he sits, so she's sitting, and he's effectively standing over her seeing that she's uncomfortable, seeing that she's terrified, and with a good deal of cold sternness, says, it's no use to talk to you. We'd better put an end to this mortifying conference. You have dis disappointed every expectation I had formed and proved yourself the character, uh, proved yourself of a character the very reverse of what I supposed. This is the, like, ultimate, I'm not angry, I'm so disappointed speech, although he's a bit angry too. And he even accu he accuses her of ingratitude, he accuses her of not thinking of her family um, when he knows that that she's always been um, concerned for her family's welfare. That uh, one of the the things that is is weighing on her as she decides whether or not she can possibly accept this man is that he is wealthy, and that if she marries him, she'll be able to support her family. And he throws that kind of at her. Um, and basically doesn't give her the opportunity to respond, even if she felt that she were able to, which I'm not sure that Fanny would. Um, the other thing that's important to notice, to know about Sir Thomas is that he um, derives a significant portion of his estate from the West Indies. And at this time, we're talking about slave plantations. Um, and, it, you know, he she, she says, I, I asked him about the slave trade, but there was such dead silence um she wants to know about it she wants to um, find out about it and uh he doesn't have anything to say the family does not have anything to say it's such a important silence in this book um it's not really part of this presentation to go through some of the abolitionist ideas um, or anti-abolitionist ideas people have seen both of those things in austin and particularly in Mansfield park um um, but there's yeah there's a layer there that uh, he's that he is that man who was physically overseas in the West Indies um, overseeing a plantation and it was a plantation that used enslaved labor um, and that's who this guy is that was her guardian that she that she looked up to and took her cues from and tried to please um, as an adolescent other members of the family. Aunt Bertram, Julia and Mariah. Aunt Bertram is um, is very much dependent on Fanny and her um, uh, and she just basically can't conceive of life without Fanny. Fanny has been invited out to dinner and Aunt Bertram's response is I can't spare her and I'm sure she doesn't want to go. Fanny, you don't want to go, do you? So there, there's definitely that emotional pressure. I need you. I'm the lady of the house and I need you. What, you know, what, what else could there be? Um, and that's, that's, that's Lady Bertram the whole way. She's a very um, um, weak character physically and or mentally. Um and depends on Fanny a lot. And what does she need Fanny for? She says, well, Fanny pours the tea. Fanny pours the tea. It's not that she is um, physically dependent on Fanny so much as it's an emotional dependency, it seems to be. Um, Mariah and Julia, the sisters, her cousins, they could not but hold her cheap on finding that she had but two sashes, had never learned French, and when they perceived her to be little struck with a the duet, they were so good as to play, they could do no more than make a generous present of some of their least valued toys and leave her to herself while they adjourned to whatever might be the favourite holiday sport of the moment, making artificial flowers or wasting gold paper. This is the ch children's response to the new cousin that's come to visit. They look down on her. They kind of take, they see themselves as doing good things for her when what they're actually doing is, is quite self-serving. And that attitude just doesn't change. Realistically, it doesn't change.
the whole way through. Aunt Norris. So Aunt Norris, let me just move my little um, video square. Aunt Norris, um, this is from a an adaptation of Mansfield Park that I wrote and directed as a play, and this was part of our um, um, advertising for it. Aunt Norris, the reason you don't want to go to Christmas lunch. She is the third of the sisters um, of whom uh, Lady Bertram is one, um, Fanny's mother is the other, and then Aunt Norris is the third. And even though she doesn't live at Mansfield Park, she seems to constantly be there and constantly be sticking her nose in when Sir Thomas is away and um, and Lady Bertram is not really the sort of person who exert who uh, exercises a lot of authority it's Aunt Norris who just basically takes over um, and sort of pushes people around and in some ways she's the harshest to Fanny and it just starts with little things where to put where to put Fanny when she comes to stay Put her in the little white attic near the old nurseries. It'll be the best place for her close by the housemaids. So that's where, what Aunt Norris thinks of Fanny's place in the home. Um, and the, the, the place that, that Fanny uses for her kind of sitting room or where she writes letters and does all that kind of stuff, that's basically a room that, that's just been abandoned because nobody else in the family uses it. Mrs Norris stipulates that there must never be a fire there just for Fanny, okay? So if anybody else is there, there is allowed to be a fire. But if it's only Fanny in there, there can never be a fire on Fanny's account. This is like, you do not turn the heating on, does not matter how cold it is. That girl does not deserve the amount of um, consideration, the amount of effort and the amount of cost that it is to have a fire in this room, to keep her warm in the middle of a um, massive um, country estate in the middle of an English winter. She says to Fanny, literally, wherever you are, you must be the lowest and the last. And that is the message she's constantly drumming into Fanny. This is very explicit. That is a quote from what she says to Fanny, but in everything that she does. So Fanny's um, invited out to dinner and Mrs Norris says, well, that must be because they respect the family at Mansfield Park so much. Not because they like you, but it's, because it's, it's a compliment to the Bertrams. It's not a compliment to you. Um, Fanny can walk. Um, she's going out somewhere. She doesn't need the carriage. We're not going to get the carriage out and warm up the horses or anything like that. We're not going to. We're not going to even allow our servants to take any trouble for Fanny's for Fanny's comfort or for Fanny's um, needs. Um, however far it is, Fanny can walk, and that's Aunt Norris's attitude again. That's literally what she says. And then when Mariah, uh, Fanny's cousin, runs away with. Henry Crawford, uh, you know, the scandalous married woman um, having an affair. Aunt Norris blames Fanny for not having married Mr. Crawford. If you had married him, this wouldn't have happened. And you're like, she was married. It technically shouldn't, shouldn't have happened. Married people have affairs. Don't see how you're pinning this one on Fanny, but she was. So Aunt Norris is just constantly at her, like literally the entire book, not a good word. For Fanny, and you can just imagine being a, a, a naturally shy ten-year-old and having this person in your life, um, an aunt, so your mother's sister, somebody that your mother has fond memories of. Um, you're being separated from your mother, and this person is giving you this all the time. Now, Edmund, I'm just going to move this again, so you've got this lovely picture here. Um, Edmund knew her to be clever, to have a quick apprehension as well as good sense and a fondness for reading, but he recommended the books which charmed her leisure hours. He encouraged her taste and corrected her judgment because her judgment needed correcting. He made reading useful by talking to her of what she read and heightened its attractive, attraction by judicious praise. In return for such services, she loved him better than anybody in the world except William. That's her brother. Um, her heart was divided between the two. So Edmund is the only person in the, in the Bertram family who shows anything even remotely like affection. Um, she gets kind of this patriarchal kind of oversight from her uncle, Sir Thomas. She gets this need from her aunt. She gets, um, she gets this crit constant criticism from her other aunt. She gets pretty much ignored by her three other cousins and Edmund's the only one who treats her kindly. But there's, there's this... 
um, patronizing quality to it. Um, but Edmund is older than her when she when she comes to Metzwood Park. He's um, sort of sixteen, I believe, and she's ten. So you know that age gap does make a difference, and and you know in addition to to the fact that they are first cousins, it makes the fact of them end, ending up married a little bit weird for those of us who think about those things too 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 closely. But this is what this is what Austin is writing about. Um, that he, she looks up to him, she adores him for the small bits of kindness that he shows her. Um, this illustration is from from a scene early in the book that um, Fanny um, seems to only be able to get the exercise she needs from um, riding a horse, and Edmund is the one who makes sure that she has access to a horse um, for to be able to go out riding, get some fresh air, get a little bit of exercise. Um, uh, when Mary Crawford comes along, um, that stops um, for a short period of time while, while uh, Edmund's kind of oblivious to Fanny's needs and, and Mary Mary does the writing. But um, overall, Fanny um, Edmund is, is quite um, protective of Fanny, tries to look after her, tries to push back just a little bit on some of the things that his family does that are, that are particularly mean to her to push back on the, the insults and to push back on trying to get her the things that she needs. Uh, but there is always in it this kind of patronising quality. Uh, you must not mind growing up into a pretty woman. Um, yeah, I, I guess it's a, it is, I mean, it is a compliment. It is a compliment. Um, uh, that, that at the same time that he's, he's also singing the praises of Mary Crawford to her. So, you know, half, half the compliment is that, in, uh, you know, that Ed, Edmund um, thinks of her as a confidant. And yet they end up getting married. And how does this all impact on Fanny? Um, I've put this um, um, poster in for the 1999 film um, of Mansfield Park with Frances O'Connor, um, which is which is a divisive film. Um, it's it's Fanny is such a hard character to portray on screen because. She's so much of the story is about her interior life, and that's not something that translates super well to screen. Um, although I think they did manage it in the nineteen nineties. Um, persuasion is a separate separate question. Let's not let's not let's not compare. Um, but this was this was an interesting um, adaptation, and it's one of the few that takes seriously uh, some of the ideas about about um, slavery and about colonialism in in Austen. Um, we haven't quite seen anything like it since, so uh, you know that's that's something to come. Um, and the interpretation of Fanny in this is then because of that difficulty of translating her kind of shyness and translating her uh, quietness and introspection onto the screen, and partly I think also because it's hard to like such a sh shy and retiring and self-effacing and unself-confident woman. Um, they've sort of made her the sort of person who's very shy in front of certain people, but then with Edmund is a lot more bubbly and bright and um, says witty things a bit like Elizabeth Bennet or a, a bit like Austen herself. So they've sort of they've sort of tried to have it both ways in terms of Fanny's personality. However, how has this impacted Fanny? I mean, there are a lot of people who think well of Fanny um, and Edmund, Edmund's one of them, um, and Mary and Henry Crawford are two, two of those people as well. However, in all of those cases, there's a bit of a sense of them liking her but like wanting to um, have power over her. So Henry wants to marry her. Um, Henry wants to to make her the sort of person who would marry somebody like him, I guess. Um, and Mary sort of is trying to push her in, in a different direction as well. But they want they want her um, approval, and they want her um, uh, the the her value judgments to be on their side. Um, but don't always kind of express that in ways that make us think that they actually have her own best interest at heart. So this, this 
these these relationships she has with these people who do like her but feel a bit like they can push her around and in the end they find that they can't. So Edmund is trying to convince Fanny to like Mary Crawford and he never manages <laughs> because Edmund's planning to marry Mary and he's trying to get Fanny on side. He's trying to get Fanny on side as well to be part of their play and she never she never agrees. So so um, and and both Mary and Henry are trying to convince her to join their family, like literally to marry into that family, and they don't succeed. Um, so there's there's an attempt in some of them to to try and try and sort of manipulate her in some ways, um, but there's also a genuine liking there for her. Susan is um, Fanny's biological sister that she is perhaps closest to when she goes home, and she takes Susan under her wing and and. The, the end of the novel has her basically moving into Mansfield Park and and taking over Fanny's role in the family when she does that, which is really interesting because it's sort of the, the book portrays um, Susan as a little bit tougher than Fanny to start with, that she's coped, she, she's grown up a bit more than Fanny has in that Portsmouth environment, in that sort of rough and tumble, that um, a little bit more rough environment, that a little bit lower class environment, and she's coped. And so transport, you get the sense that transporting Susan to Mansfield Park is not going to squash her flat in the same way as it has for Fanny. And it's not going to traumatise her in the same way as it has for Fanny. That she's somebody who's a little bit more capable of standing up for herself. You also get the feeling that Fanny's kind of paved the way, that her insistence on, on having, um, on, on being who she is um, and the, the family having then seen that that turns out better than anything that happens to their own kids, basically, um, it may well pave the way for Susan to have a better experience. That's almost sort of passing the baton onto the next, not quite generation, but that that's the sort of uh, vibe you get about her, her younger sister. Um, the, the impact on Fanny as well, in terms of Mansfield, Portsmouth and belonging, she she never feels that she belongs at Mansfield. She she When she's offered the opportunity to go back to her home to Portsmouth, she's looking forward to it so much. And then when she gets there, she finds she doesn't belong there either. And it's terribly, terribly sad that she ends the novel basically, again, moving into another place, that is Edmund's place, um, with this hope that she might be able to make a place where she actually does belong. Um, and that depends, I guess, in some ways on, on what the dynamic, dynamic of their married relationship is going to be. I'm in two minds about it. Ask me on a different day and I'll, I'll tell you whether I'm optimistic or pessimistic about their capacity to make a, a relationship work long term. Um, Fanny's power in the end ends up being her power to say no to things. Um, that she, when she when she says no, that's the final no, and it's kind of um, Austen's take, I guess, on ideas about consent. Um, Austen, you know, obviously, two hundred years ago, but but Fanny says no, I'm not having Henry Crawford, and all these people keep pushing her and pushing her. And she says, basically, no is a complete sentence. Yeah. The family try to push her into taking part in their theatricals. And the the the, the, the theatric, family theatrics is, is a bit of a complex issue because, you know, we know that Austen was fond of going to the theatre. We know that Austen's family did family theatricals. But it's pretty clear also in this that Fanny disapproves of them having this, putting on this play, and that she turns out to be right, that it all sort of turns up really badly and her uncle doesn't like it. There's a few different ways to read it. Did she just know that her uncle wouldn't like it? Is Fanny a, a very prudish person, a very conservative person uh, who just happened to be right? Or is she a very insightful person who knew that this was an excuse for the young people to basically kind of explore their own sexuality and, um, you know, in very, in very bounded ways, but still more unbounded than what their society would otherwise let them do and that that could be a really dangerous thing for them um, in the eyes of the broader society. Um, but in the end, she says no and she's right. And in spite of all those pressures to say yes, she says no to things. She doesn't actively choose a lot of things. 
but the main things that she has power over are her nose. And that's a little sad. Um, she does get what she wants in the end, which is the relationship with Edmund. Um, and, and that's another thing that, that Austen kind of portrays as being a little bit unusual, that she is she falls in love with him before he falls in love with her. So the, the sort of uh, romantic trope might be that he falls in love first and has to convince her. But this is different. Um, she falls in love first and just has to wait for him. And... Uh, you know, I'm not. I'm certainly not suggesting that's a grand feminist statement, and there's certainly a lot of um, powerlessness in Fanny. Um, but uh, it's something interesting in that too. The the subversion, however slight, of that particular romantic trope. But this is the impact on Fanny: the limited social circle that she has, the comparison to her younger sister, who's less likely to be able to be manipulated. Her, the impact on her sense of belonging um, to a place or to people and and the main power that she ends up having being that power just to refuse. Um, that's, I think, the trauma that, that she experiences and that's, I think, where a lot of her, the things that we find so frustrating about her, her constant sort of put-downs, her constant... Um, going out of her way to be nice to people who we know don't respect her, to be nice to people who um, don't deserve it, um, can come from these kinds of traumas growing up. Yeah. Let's keep going. Speculation. Oh, I just threw in this because speculation, I'm going to speculate a little bit on about Fanny Price, um, but speculation is also a card game. Um, that involves a sort of hard, hard, hard nosed bargaining. It's sort of like a stock market speculation, but with cards and people pay for small amounts of money. Um, and there's a scene in the novel where uh, Henry Crawford uh, teaches her how to play and she learns pretty quickly, but he won't give her her cards back. And she's, and he's trying to teach her how to play ruthlessly. Um, and she is always wanting to play as kindly as possible to the people around her. Um, that she she's not she doesn't have she doesn't have a ruthless bone in her body she doesn't have a um, even when it comes to cards she's that kind of gentle and unable to say to him just let me do what I want to do with my own cards but my speculation about Fanny um, is just to, to observe that there is nowhere in in the novel that specifies that Fanny is is what um, so one part of speculate the speculation that I had around Maxwell Park, and um, it is purely speculation, is that since since her mother um, married a sailor, and there were a lot of sailors from pl places like India and places like China who lived in Portsmouth, what if Fanny's father was actually from India or China and Fanny was biracial? And how would that impact on the additional trauma she's feeling being out of place at Mansfield Park? Uh, this is a photo of the lovely actress Carly Shanti, who played Fanny in um, um, a version of Mansfield Park that I wrote and directed for the stage. And we specifically explored that experience of being um, uh, treated as lesser and being othered, um, both through the lens of race, but also through the lens of class and the other issues that Fanny's story brings up. Um, and that was one of the things that I wanted to bring to to the fore in that in that piece is to say, well, what if Fanny has other reasons as well to feel that level of um, squashed um, by society and by the people around her? What if she has those other levels of being aware of global injustices that the Mansfield Park family are, are benefiting from and really oblivious to? Um, what if Fanny Price were also biracial? Um, and if you want to see uh, that version, um, there is a we, we, we did record it and um, you can you can watch that online. Stay tuned. I will tell you how to do that at the end. Um, Fanny is shown as being fairly physically frail, that she struggles with strenuous exercise. Um, and so so you also have to wonder, or I have to wonder, it, with if there's some kind of physical disability. Um, um, that might also 
play into uh, the additional trauma that she has. Um, again, not mentioned, um, but how would that impact? And, and obviously the other speculation is to do with her mental health. We talk about trauma and the impact of trauma. Does Fanny have um, depression? Um, is she is she is she okay? Does she have is she having panic attacks at the, some of these points? Um, I think it's worth thinking about those because I think that human these these questions can give us more context around Fanny and give us more empathy for her and for the way that she responds to people um, when we otherwise find it hard to to empathize with her her humility, I guess. Worth thinking about, just worth thinking about. Here's a question that, again, I also think is worth thinking about. Have the, um, have the family at Mansfield Park, essentially in Fanny, created a monster? Uh, um, what are the tropes in this story? Is it a sort of Cinderella story who's, you know, the poor cousin that's with the stepsisters or with the cousins in this case, um, who, you know, finally gets to go to the ball? Um, is this a story of a model Christian? Have they sort of squashed her so much that she's become, you know, the perfect woman, the perfect submissive wife? Because there are certainly stories, um, other stories from around this time that indicate that she sort of fits a mould of um, Christian piety that some people had, right? Um, you know, this this woman who is so good and so virtuous that she draws other people to her, who sort of transforms other people by her goodness. Um, again, that's not something that I'm attracted to, that most of us today are attracted to, but, you know, that's one way to read Mansfield Park. Is she actually a monster? Has, have they created a sort of monster? Um, have they, have the, have the family sort of, um, you know, made a Frankenstein out of <laughs> Um, um, you know, Frankenstein's monster is this sort of uh, lonely, isolated figure um, who's despised by all the people around him who ends up um, kind of consuming in his desire to find connection. Um, obviously not a one-to-one -one connection with Frankenstein, but there are some, there are some kind of um, elements, elements of, of that, um, there that in in Frankenstein's desire to create desire potentially to do something good he's he's created this figure that doesn't fit in and that is desperate for connection and definitely that some of those things apply to Fanny as well um, other people have suggested she's a kind of Hamlet figure just that sort of very um, introspective very um kind of depressive um, um, affect that she has. There may be something in that. I'm a little bit less convinced about that one. Um, people have noticed that she doesn't eat very much and wonder if that, well, I wonder about that in terms of mental health um, issues, whether that makes her a vampire. She's very pale. She's described as being quite pale. Um, it's, yeah, that's a less, less, less than but Beowulf is similar to the Frankenstein idea that, that she is someone who is constantly on the outside looking in, feeling monstrous, feeling othered, and feeling like she doesn't belong. Um, the, 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 some of these um, stories and, and, and um, myths, I guess you would say, that were, that were prominent, uh, Frankenstein was, was written um, sort of roughly contemporaneously with Austin's, what some of Austin's work. Um, explore these ideas about how being um, an outsider um, kind of pushes people into monstrosity. And if we do see elements of monstrosity in her, which some people might call a very good Christian woman, and some others of us, depending on your point of view, might call monstrousness. <laughs> uh, because, yeah, let's face it, that level of Yes, aunt. No, aunt. I'll do whatever you want, aunt. Is a, is 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 quite monstrous to us. It's quite um, unhealthy, um, rather than a, a role model for a good Christian. Then a lot of that can be placed back onto the creators of the monster. And who are the creators of that monster? Well, arguably the, the family at Mansfield Park who have pushed her into that position, who have created her sort of in their image, but as a less. 
topics. Um, just worth thinking about. That is just some interesting kind of speculation again um, on ways of reading Mansfield Park, ways of reading Fanny Price's personality, reading her trauma, um, reading the neglect and abuse that happened to her um, as a child. Um, and so, yeah, I hope you've enjoyed a little bit of a Cook's tour of some thoughts about Fanny Price. Um, I did say that I would give you information about our previous productions. So if you go to 24caratproductions.com, um, that is uh, our theatre company, and you will be able to purchase access to some of our previous Austin adaptations. Not all of them because we haven't, we haven't um, filmed all of them, but there are some, including Mansfield Park. So if you are interested to see Fanny Price as a biracial he heroine um, and the way that that kind of feeds into the ideas about her um, a victimhood and her trauma and uh, her strength, then that would be a place to have a look. Um, it also does give you the option to get in touch with us if you have any further questions or obviously you can leave comments on this video and uh, we will try to get back to you. Thank you very much for watching. I just want to again say thank you very much to the virtual JaneCon team for um, creating this wonderful worldwide event and for allowing me to be part of it. Uh, enjoy. Happy Austining. <laughs>